for our next speaker to be here. Matter of fact, we wouldn't be here without him. Colin is the person that gave us Nexus. He's a person that is, well, a genius. I had a chance to get a uh, talk with him earlier today. And I got to tell you something. I ask, I'm a journalist. I'm always asking questions, talking to people, interviewing regularly. That's what I do on a regular basis. And so I asked him, okay, what's going on lately that really excites you about Nexus, of what's happening? And I love the answer he gave me just this morning, just a few moments ago as we were walking down the path here to a breakfast this morning here. He said, Terry, it's the ability of people to come together peacefully to create new ideas, new solutions through decentralization. That's what Nexus is about, and that's what you are about. And so right now, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome our next speaker, Colin Cantrell, the founder of Nexus. Hello, all right, this on? All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Nexus Conference. Glad you guys all made it here. It's a long track for some of us, but we all made it. So I guess uh, I'm going to start over with uh, kind of beginning on some of the history of Nexus and kind of where the genesis of this idea came from. So it kind of started, I guess you could say, a long time ago when I started realizing some of the things that were wrong with the world, how we, we see how these central banks are starting to take over different governmental systems and how People, I guess you could say, have been divided further and further through politics, through sports teams, through any other type of, how should I say, it, societal structure and psychological structure that keeps people from really seeing the true essence of who we are. And so when I was gone this path and I started working on alternative energy systems, trying to figure out how to increase the efficiency of automobiles by you know, vaporizing the fuel or working on electrolysis methods to kind of make cleaner burning gasoline engines. And then that led me into cryptocurrencies in about 2013. And I realized, hey, you know, this is, this is the way that we can truly change the world. Now we have tools. We have tools at our disposal in order to make things better. But the, the other thing that really needed to be seen, and that's something Satoshi brought with his idealism, is that how do I say it? We, we need to change our thoughts. We need to change the way you think. And when I first started building Nexus, I didn't know how to build it. I, you know, there was nothing there. You know, you had to look at the code. That's all there was to see. And from that, it kind of just started this long, long, long journey through lines and lines and lines. I mean, 170, 180,000 lines until eventually started learning to think like Satoshi thought because everybody has their own psychological fingerprint that you can see through the code. And that's how I learned how to code, is by learning to read other people's code and seeing how they thought. And so from there, I kind of followed Satoshi's original ideas and learned to think like him and then said, okay, well, how can we take this further? How can we move things from this step to that step and take it to the next level? Because Bitcoin was kind of left unfinished then, and Satoshi left after WikiLeaks added it, surprisingly enough, because Satoshi was, you know, new kind of battering the beehive that Bitcoin would really do because it challenges, like Napolitano was saying, the crown. It challenges the ways that they have created central power structures that allow them to create taxation without representation, allow them to take away our rights, allow them to create these covert wars, and all these operations that really are reducing our ability to be free. Now, people say, who are they? Who are they? You're talking about they. Well, you know, I mean, the word Ernest Hancock, he said, they are those who will not leave us alone. And we have the unalienable right to live. We have the right to have have our own place. I mean, the earth provides everything for everybody. There's land everywhere. Some man has to go and they have to take a stake, put it in the ground and put an invisible border up and say, hey, now this is my land. You can't come in here, but the government can. But then we got all these state roads that we can block whenever we want and we can tax you for it. And then we can give you the illusion that you need to do all of this when society can exist without these things. We're, we're, we're still running on this archaic system that's running on paper. And even some of the politicians now are starting to realize some of the limitations of it. And that's where we get to blockchain. Because for the first time ever, like, we look at the hippie revolution where they were protesting the war. They were trying to stop all of these problems from coming into the world. They were trying to say, hey, you know, peace and love. Let's have some fun. Let's, let's all live together. There's plenty of space everywhere. Why can't we all get along? And then the war ended and it was kind of feeding that system. And 
something that I think we've forgotten these days is that we're still kind of feeding the government. When, when we think about all of these problems, and we think, you know, that doesn't really do anything to service. And it's really kind of when you start to understand the truth of everything, it, it's kind of scary because you just, wow, I mean, this world is run by criminals. And what are we going to do about it? And blockchain is that solution. And that's why Nexus development started in about 2014 because I kind of, how do I call it, a, a Bitcoin purist. Like, I still see Satoshi's ideals alive in the cryptocurrency industry these days, but there's certain aspects of it that have maybe been drowned out through the profits or the money or we're all going to do this and that and we're going to make all these everything. And it doesn't service the people as it, as it should. We have centralization in mining. We have Bitmain that produces 70, 80, 90% of all the ASICs. They even tried the ant bleed bug to put a back door into it. We have NSA putting back doors into computers. Intel processors have their own processor in them that can open and read your memory and make TCP connections. That's where they're buying all these old computers. And there's so much that's happening right now that we can solve with immutable ledgers. And we can solve it by distributing the system out because it's us that gives power to the government. It's us that gives power to the system by believing in them, by believing in that power. And by having new alternative systems to create like we can with Bitcoin, with Nexus, with cryptocurrencies, that allows us to take that power and put it into our own hands. But now together we have the tools to do that. And that's part of my role in everything here is I've been building tools, I've been building systems, I've been developing architectures by sitting back and watching how the Bitcoin industry matures and saying, well, what would Satoshi do? How can we take this and move it to the next level? Because Bitcoin has had the scaling solution problem, right? There's big blockers and there's small blockers. But if you read Bitcoin talk, you'll see Satoshi Nakamoto was the one that initially put the block size cap on to say, well, it's easy to fill up blocks right now because it's cheap. So now, if we upgrade the block size, you show people at our hard fork it, you put it N height, you set the height, say, hey, when the height's greater than this, bam, you change the block size. And then for some reason, we have this block size suppression for the soft fork and everything. And that, that created chaos in Bitcoin. And I think a lot of these ideals have been lost because the original creator, does, nobody even knows about who he is anymore. I mean, people know what a Satoshi is, but Satoshi Nakamoto, like, who is he? What were the idealism? By? What, what was Bitcoin really built for? And I personally believe in the liberty of it. I believe that cryptocurrencies have the ability to free us. They have the capability to rival world economies. They have the capability to change the world for the better, but it's simply a tool, right? Anybody can have a hammer. You can have a hammer. Somebody will learn, hey, I can beat someone in the head with this hammer. Somebody can learn, I can build a house. Now, that's the second part of it all because without the proper idealism, without the proper mental structures and understanding, how should I say it, greater constellations of truth, higher dimensional, like bird's eye view of a city compared to looking through the streets, then, then we start to understand that we're all connected. We're all here on the same planet and we don't need to be fighting each other. We can overcome these problems peacefully. We can work through our solutions because everybody's differences are strengths. That's what empowers all of us. That's what grows us all together. That's what brings us together. And when we recognize those things and stop fighting and trying to convince our opinion on somebody else, then we're going to start to realize that all of our opinions together mesh together to create a perfect puzzle. And those idealisms are something that I'm starting to see with cryptocurrencies because the world, how should I say, does not change just by people believing that we need to change. It changes by people believing in a common goal and having a common purpose together. And cryptocurrencies now are this common purpose. Now we're realizing we can decentralize the world. We can eliminate these power structures that are causing us all these problems where we're seeing, I mean, people like Edward Snowden are speaking out for liberty and then they're hiding in Russia. People like Julian Assange are whistleblowing, trying to help people realize what the shadow governments are doing. And a lot of people don't even know their lives are are kept under slavery. We're all kept under economic slavery. We're born with a bond on our name. We're all kept as debt slaves. And we need to change that if we're going to really see liberty in the future because the crown, as we know it, has come in and it has infiltrated again. It's taken the beauty of what the United States was supposed to be. And eliminated a lot of that. Where it's even illegal to talk about the Constitution in certain ways. And I think the way that we can take this power back, the way that we can do that is by joining together. And that's why we're always divided. That's why we're always so busy doing things that we'd never have time to sit and be. 
and realize that there's a lot more to life than we think that has been force fed to us through the media, through the zombie apocalypse with the smartphones where people are running into walls because they don't even know where they're going anymore. Right? I mean, we all know that. Like, yeah, the zombie apocalypse, it's here already. Like, unfortunately. And, you know, I think we're, we're coming into a time right now where there's a necessity for this change. Now, evolution as we commonly know it happens sequentially, or as we're taught, it happens in a series. Oh yeah, every generation you get better. But the true evolution of the species comes at what's called the precipice, which is the brink of destruction. And we're seeing that. The world's divided. It's fighting. We're having civil wars. We're having people trying to push their opinions on everybody and saying, I'm right. No, I'm right. No, this border's more than your border, and this money's more than hyperinflation going everywhere. And we need to do something about that. And we don't even have to worry about what that is. All we have to do is be aware of that to make sure that we don't let what we're doing become corrupted because it starts in our minds. And that's really what creates everything. We're the ones that give value to the dollar by putting it. That's the total essence of everything. If your body couldn't connect to it, you wouldn't have a proper nervous system. Your legs wouldn't be able to communicate with one another. Matter wouldn't be able to connect. I mean, even if you look inside of a cell, it's its own universe and everything in there is connected. All your DNA molecules form connections because it lowers your potential energy, which starts the basis of life. Connection is that, that I think a lot of people have lost, and we've lost it in the thought that there's no hope, or there's World War III, or watching the news, and those things we don't need anymore. We need each other. We need to come together with each other. And that's one of the real, how should I say, idealisms of Nexus that, you know, has brought a lot of people together here today, that is part of the genesis of the whole idea is that we now have a common goal and we have a common tool, but if we don't keep those idealisms alive, then... We're going to just turn this tool into another system that has created some of the atrocities we see in this world. And I personally believe in the world. I believe in people. And I believe people have a natural goodness that's taken advantage of. People say, oh yeah, trust and love, you know, oh, that's naivety. No, I mean, that's true human nature. We're not, we're not angry by birth. We're, we naturally want to trust and love one another. But that's very difficult to do when you have a world that's turned against itself. And if we look at, I mean, a comparison of the human body, every cell in the body is a part of the same whole. It's, it's functioning to give our consciousness an expression here. And if we start to recognize that on a global level and start to see, what if all your cells are fighting each other? We call that cancer. It's not sustainable. And we need to really start buckling down and making some decisions differently, changing our minds, changing our focus, and building things. Because we've got a lot of work to do to take this world and make it something that truly can be capable of freeing us. Just like the planet frees us by the water cycle, by the way nutrients pass through, by how the underwater rivers flow through everywhere. And somehow life exists, even in the desert, where there's nothing, life still finds a way. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It is given to us. Life is given to us. The planet is given to us. We need to start taking care of it. Like in the words of Carl Sagan, this is, this is where we make our stand. We're just a pale blue dot, a small speck in a vast cosmic arena. And we need to preserve and cherish this pale blue dot. And we do that by preserving and cherishing one another. And through that, we continue to build. And these are the types of things that work in tandem with the technology that blockchain allows us to do because we get into the technology side, you see that we have an immutable ledger that cannot be changed. We see that we have a distributed system that cannot be altered, that cannot be corrupted from a central point. We see that we can not only just transfer value in a currency, I mean, we can transfer data, we can store data, we can collect it, we can do different proof methods, we can develop trust with one another in a mathematical way because you cannot corrupt the fabrics of mathematics. Never. As much as you try to say it blue in the face, one plus one will always be two. And the beauty of that is everybody can independently independently verify that because we don't always make the right decisions. We make mistakes. We're all human. And that's why we need to listen to one another and let each other check and balance one another. And that's part of what's so beautiful about blockchains is every node checks one another. Every node sees what every other node does. And if you see one node get a little rogue, all the other nodes say, hey, man, we're not, we're not going to fly with this. And so the best thing I can say about it is 
we're entering into a revolution right now. And whether we like to say it or not, I mean, who is John Galt? I mean, this world itself is going into this. These, these things that we've been imagining for a long time are coming to fruition. So what side of it are we going to be on? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to do it peacefully? Are we going to do it violently? Are we going to protest? Because protesting doesn't work, does it? You know, I mean, look, look, look at the 60s. It just empowers your enemy because they're like, hey, look, all these guys are holding signs for us. Hey, look at us. We're that much better now. But like, you know, thing is, all we have to do is just turn our backs on it. We have to just change our focus. We don't, we don't need to worry about this crap anymore. We don't need to get our shoes dirty mucking in the mud that somebody else made. We just say, hey, a mud puddle, let's walk around that because we got something better. We got bridges, we got flying cars, and the technology is here. It is here. It's already been here. We just don't realize we can all do it. And we can all put these pieces together to make this new system that we don't have to worry about. They can be like was done in 1776. And interesting enough, this solar eclipse that we had this year, who saw this eclipse? You guys see it? Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, eerie moment for me. I saw the full thing and it's just, you know, there's a, the lambs are like, man, you know, going to it and it just, but for that moment, for that minute and a half, everybody stopped. They just stopped and let silence exist. And they all looked at this eclipse and they saw it all together. And for that minute, people forgot about their problems with each other. People forgot about the strife. And they were all one for that moment. And coming to that, the last time we had an eclipse that was only seen in America was guess when? 1776. So there's interesting, how should I say it, signs kind of coming around, especially when we're seeing anybody that, I mean, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Federal Reserve, and now we're seeing, you know, the national debt quadrupling, and I mean, going ridiculous levels. Now they're actually going to get rid of the debt ceiling because, of course, we are living in a debt-based currency. Nobody reads the fine print. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. But that's coming to an end. We're seeing hyperinflation all over the world. We're seeing these problems that are coming out. We're seeing these wars trying to be started. And now is very, very important for all of us to stay united, to stay together, to, I guess, preserve ourselves, preserve our humanity, like Napolitano was saying. I mean, humanity is where we all are, we're all here together. So we all need to figure out how we're gonna continue to work together and how we're gonna build a better way. Because if we don't, we might not have a world to give our children. And that's something we all need to seriously consider because now is the time to make this change. And this change starts in your heart and it starts in your mind. It starts in you saying, you know what? I'm not gonna watch the news today. You know what? I'm gonna leave my cell phone here while I go and I play with my daughter and son. You know, I'm gonna go walk outside and get some fresh air. I'm gonna take my shoes off and feel the grass. I'm gonna go for a hike. I'm gonna go do some learning today. The simplest things like that start allowing us to expand in our awareness. And even something as simple as, I don't know if you guys are familiar, have you heard of the Schumann frequency? Anybody know what the Schumann frequency is? Yeah, all right, we got some peeps. So the Schumann frequency actually was discovered by Nikola Tesla. Now they all called him crazy back in those days. It, around six to seven hertz, it was a very stable frequency because Earth is like a giant capacitor, okay? So the upper ionosphere and the ground, they actually, lightning goes up and down and there's this frequency that you could measure. Now, I don't know if any of you are aware, but that frequency has been on the rise since the 80s. Now it's pushing close to 20, 30 hertz, fluctuates a lot, but that affects every single one of us. We have 64 base pairs of DNA and we only use eight. That means we have 56 base pairs, they call it non-coded DNA or junk DNA. We already have the code. It's already there. We're already evolved enough to be what we can be. And these types of things are starting to be revealed more and more. And of course, you know, conventional science will say, oh yeah, well, that's pseudoscience. Or that's what, well, I mean, I can measure with an oscilloscope my bioelectrical frequency, and I can see how my bioelectrical frequency affects other people's. And you can start to see and measure electromagnetic fields around people. And we're starting to breach into, especially with quantum mechanics, a completely new type of science that is showing us that the reality that we perceive may not be the reality we perceive. You have the uncertainty principle. Nothing exists until it's measured. It does not have a quantum state until you measure that state. Think about that. Until you measure it, 
That means what you measure everything to be, what you think things to be is what they're going to be. Now, that's a really interesting type of science because it completely throws all our conventional classical physics out the window. Quantum mechanics is completely changing the way we all think. And that's a common bridge that we all need because the last renaissance is when they said, hey, we're not going to listen to the crown anymore. We're going to independently verify each other with a scientific method. We're going to put these facts out here and we're going to allow other people to check those facts. And then that will determine the veracity of our argument. And that, I think, is coming upon now. We have two choices. We can either destroy ourselves or we're going to have a new renaissance. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I want to have another renaissance. I mean, the arts, music, peace, love. It's about time. We need this as a planet. We need this as people because we've been deprived too long. I'm sick of seeing people in China that are stuck in these little boxes, four by eight, barely surviving, dying. All these people that are just thrown under the bus. People that are homeless. When I go to Hollywood, there's homeless people everywhere. It breaks my heart. That shouldn't be that way because we're all born into this debt. We're all born into this system. And the economic system is completely controlled by a single entity. And that has created thousands of people to be out of work. Thousands of people to be struggling. And I think everybody, it's our God-given right to have the same opportunity for our success. But not everybody has that. Not everybody's born into the same positions. And that's something that we need to truly recognize. Because... Everybody deserves the same opportunity. Now, not everybody should have the same, oh, here's a handout, we're going to give the public, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Everybody needs to earn their way. But if you don't have the opportunity to, you may never even see five miles out of your village. I mean, some people in third world countries, I don't know if any of you have traveled, it's really eye-opening. Some of these people have not traveled more than three to five miles from their village. Three to five miles. That little village is all they've ever known. And I think that with the technology we have these days, we don't need to have that anymore. There doesn't need to be imbalance just so that a few can live off of the many. And they, they who will not leave us alone, they know that. They don't want us to know that. That's a secret they don't want us to know. Because we know that. We're not going to let this happen anymore. We are opting in. We are volunteering our power. We are giving it away by saying, oh, well, you know, 50% taxes, I guess that's, you know, it's not death in taxes. It's that's all life. Well, you, I mean, they were protesting like 2 to 5% with the Boston Tea Party. Like, if that, like, come on, people. Like, why are we allowing everybody to just rule? That's, that's the biggest thing is like, these guys have no power. They are the powers that were to me. They only have power because we give them power. And now we have Bitcoin, we have Nexus, we have cryptocurrencies, and we can choose what we want to empower. We can choose who we want to empower. And those types of things are what's going to bring people together. Those types of things are what's going to allow this peaceful revolution to happen. We don't need to fight them. We just need to make them obsolete. And we make them obsolete by making a new model that is better than their model. And everything about cryptography, everything about... <laughs> Blockchain, it is completely superior in every single way. The more we all look at it, the more I'm like, well, we got this transaction right here, digital signatures. We got hash cash, which is, you know, just glorified checksums, if we want to call it that, with, you know, a high cost. Well, look at this. Now we have this immutable ledger. What else are we going to make immutable? We've got our currency immutable. Why don't we make some transparency with all these politicians? Oh, wait, wait, you mean we can't have these little voter fraud things with counties recounting and recounting and recounting and all this paper possibly being burned? Who knows? But we don't know. We can't see that as people. We're sitting here like, what the hell is this world doing sometimes? Like, who are these monkeys in control? Like, what are they doing? How does it cost $20,000 for a pencil and $5,000 for a hammer in Iraq? What? What is going on? And then we start asking that question and be like, oh man, that's a deep rabbit hole. But ultimately, we can have a little bit better idea of these things when we have blockchain, when we have transparency, when we have accountability. That is something that I think all politicians are missing. What if you could just have, let's say, something we're developing with Nexus, an ambassador contract. Now the whole network can vote it through different Republic-style voting groups that are done through your signature chains. I'll get to all that stuff, the techie stuff, tomorrow, but I'll spare you details. But then 
we elect, let's say, somebody to represent us for whatever, because not everybody wants to, you know, represent themselves. They're just like, hey, yeah, I just kind of want to sit in my house and do whatever and have somebody else do the work for me. And this contract's put out there. Now, this contract could have a certain amount of funds deposited into it or minted into it over a specific time on the terms of this contract. And people can compete for these contracts. And then let's say we see well, this one guy that's supposed to be building a road. Let's just say in Arizona, for an example, you know, so let's just say we get rid of the federal, we're going to, we're making our own highway. Here's, Here's an ambassador contract for these guys. And then we start seeing that, you know, they're spending that money on hookers and blow or whatever else these guys do. And we'll be like, well, that's not very nice. Well, let's fire them. And what if we could do that too? What if we could just vote to fire them in an instant, just like that? We're going to have a lot better politicians because <laughs> they're going to have to step up their game or like, you know, get some better bullshit going or whatever. But like, either way, like, these types of things, they're going to accelerate. And that's, that's what we're going to be seeing. Everything's going to be accelerating, 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 proliferation, exponential growth. That's what's happening with the world right now. There's so many people. The Schumann frequency is increasing. People are waking up. We're realizing these truths. And the biggest truth we're realizing is the unalienable truth that we're all created equal. We're all the same here. We all have the same amount of life force within us. And that's something we can't forget. You know, we go and we make glorious things. We build this grand whatever. But it's about the creation, not about you as a creator. You know, that's at least how I see it. You make something beautiful. It's beautiful. You make it for the sake of beauty, not for the sake of ego and self-importance. Imagine self-importance. It's, it's a delusion. Because we're all here, we're all capable. We all have the same opportunity. Some of us exercise other things to build things. Some of us just, you know, want to consume. And we're all here with that same opportunity. We're all here with that same purpose to just learn. That's all we need to do. The meaning of life, I think the meaning of life is life. And you know what I think life means? Life is learning. You know, when you don't learn, what else is there to do? You get stuck, you get bored, you turn to other methods in order to try to elevate yourself back to that position we're, we're all here to grow and we're all here to grow together and so if we neglect that fact we're not going to be able to be what we can be we're not going to be able to see this beauty we can all create together and that's something i still believe in i still believe in human ingenuity i still believe in the human expression and how beautiful it really is and how i think some people have maybe forgotten that and coming full circle back to blockchain, this is starting to remind me of that same thing because people are seeing a direct reflection of their beliefs in a currency and the value and the transmission and the services. We're starting to see real life expressions of that. We believe in Bitcoin. So therefore Bitcoin is gonna become bigger. Bitcoin is gonna grow. And that's something that we all need to remember is that it's what we choose to believe, it's what we choose to focus on that really is gonna magnetize everything into our lives. Now, call it whatever you wanna call it. You know, I call it physics, but other people call it what they, everybody's gotta have an opinion, right? I mean, but that's what makes the world go around, so. But ultimately, I think uh, it's about damn time that we all get together. And I think it's amazing that all of you have come together here and that we're all here to share and learn and grow from one another and share the knowledge that we have. And it's a privilege to be standing on stage after somebody like Napolitano and to be able to listen to him and learn from him and see everything he's gone through among all these other people. And so with that, I guess I shall introduce, how long? Yeah, well, sir. I'm bad on the time thing. I'm kind of a timeless person. My bad, guys. I get on a rant, you know, like everybody knows, oh, there goes Colin again. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like to introduce somebody that was a great influence on my life as well. My father, Jim Cantrell. And uh, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with what he's doing, but he is uh, going to come here and tell you a little bit more. Some of the ways we're disrupting the space industry and how we're able to start taking that and putting it in people's hands. So without further ado, Jim Cantrell.
Hey, thanks, Colin. I guess we're going to wait for uh, a screen to come down. Uh, so I've got some, I got some slides and stuff. So, uh, you guys awake back there? Okay. All right. So, yeah. How did you guys like the first two speakers this morning? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a little biased. I don't know if I like my son or Judge Napolitano better, but. Um, no, judge, judge, if you're in the audience, you know, you're one of my heroes, one of my, uh, one of my heroes that, that uh, speaks power, or speaks uh, truth to power, and uh, it's a real honor to even have shared a stage with him, so, and it's an honor for me to be here today talking to you guys, so what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is try to put into context for you really what I think is a revolution that's happening, and uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a personal story, because I think you'll find it interesting. Um, and try to show you how Bitcoin is yet just Bitcoin. I use that in the general. I'm sorry. This is the Nexus conference. How cryptocurrency is a big part of this this puzzle that this revolution that's going on that uh, that we're uh, about to experience. So hopefully, I'll get my slides up here in a second. Ooh, the lights are coming down. Either that or it's glaucoma, right? So, um, so while he's doing that. Um, yeah, it was funny. I was listening this morning uh, to the speakers and uh, Judge Napolitano in particular, and that reminded me of a speech uh, or a, a guy I met yesterday who was a salesman, and uh, he's he's trying to sell me a new factory for my rockets. So you never you never want to believe necessarily. Ah, oh, there we go. Hey. You know, I always thought my ideas were really big, so here we go. <laughs> Thank you, tree people. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, so anyhow, he, he, he says, I think I know what kind of guy you are. I looked at your bookshelf, and I said, okay, what kind of guy am I? And he says, I think you're, you're an intellectual, but you're impatient with people who don't do things. You're a doer. And I said, yeah, actually, you really got it right on. So what I've kind of come to see myself as a, as a, as a, as a part of a bigger, a bigger movement, uh, and I've reluctantly come to discover that I'm actually a revolutionary at heart. And, uh, I, you know, sitting here with you guys and this group of people, uh, you're all my people, you know, we, we're, uh, we're, we're doing ourselves kind of people. We don't want, uh, others telling us what to do. And we love, we, we love among more things than in our life is, is our ability to do what we think is the right thing. So let me uh, just get going on this then. So what I want to talk about is, is the role of technology and revolution. Um, you know, while if you go back those evil revolutions in my mind, and I'm still an ardent anti-communist in my heart. I will never be anything else. And uh, the, the communist revolution in Russia, which became the Soviet Union, then attempted to turn that on the world to oppress the freedom of the entire world. And truly, they look to use technology to, to do that oppression. And their May Day parades that you would see every May was, you know, with all the, the trumpets blaring and the, and the flags and so on, was their demonstration of their might over you, the individual, and hopefully over other countries that would, that would uh, worry about that. So we in the United States, um, as we looked at this, knew that the Soviet Army post-World War II was numerically superior to us, and uh, we used technology to fend them off. And it wasn't a pretty technology. Uh, and when I was young, I used to think that I'd probably never live to see this day because I thought this would be my end personally. And uh, how many actually did the drills where we put our heads down under the desk in school? I see a few hands. I used to call it kiss your ass goodbye drills. <laughs> and uh, you know, as if the desk was gonna protect me from this. Uh, but it was an uneasy piece, right? It really worked, astonishingly. But it's a technology, it's a terrible technology. It's, it's ferocious. I, it's, it's one of those things you can't hardly describe, but it, it, was, it was part of keeping the tyranny away from this country, away from the rest of the world. To, even, even going on today, look at what we're doing with North Korea. You know, it's, the discussion's all about this. Let's face it, that's what it is. But things are different now. Guess what our weapon is today? It's that damn cell phone, right? Think about it. We have bypassed all the things that these tyrannies in the world, including our own government, by the way, 
that wants us to not be able to communicate with each other. Why do you think the NSA is so interested in what you're tapping out on your cell phones? Same thing Judge Napolitano said. They're worried about what you're thinking. They're worried about what you're saying to each other, and they want to stop you doing it. This is the tool of the modern revolutionary, and it's a beautiful thing. And it was something that we never would have imagined becoming a tool of a revolution. And so, so that different form is, is a big deal. I got to be friends sort of um, uh, by accident with the CEO of Twitter, um, Jack Dorsey. And Jack, uh, he, he originally developed Twitter as a, as a messaging platform for, for taxis and, and so forth. And what he was really not prepared for was that his Twitter platform became a tool for revolution. You know, we all remember the, uh, the Twitter revolution in the Middle East. Uh, but it's also a tool for terrorists. It's a tool for good. It's a tool for bad. It's a tool for our president, right? <laughs> That's his po foreign policy mouth. And I asked Jack, I said, how do you feel about this? And he said, you know, I really don't know. But it's like what Colin was just saying. It's a force for good. And just like cryptocurrency of any form, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. But it's also a tool for revolution. And it's up to us to use these tools to make the world that we want. Nobody got the American Revolution and the liberty that it bought us by standing still. We got it by taking up arms against our tyrants and killing them. And many of us got killed in the process as well. So this is, this is never an abstract kind of intellectual exercise. It's very, very real. And of course, how can we not talk about this, right? So, so these are guys that hide, sometimes they get caught the hacker collective, we call them anonymous, they call themselves all sorts of things. They've taken on the NSA, right? They've taken on the dishonorable conduct of our own intelligence agencies that I actually helped build to spy on all of us. And uh, bravo to these guys, they use the same technology that's being used against them and turned it back on their enemy. So Colin mentioned this, and uh, who's John Galt? What were, I assume all you guys are, are, are familiar with Atlas Shrugged, right? That was one of those, those libertarian awakenings for me. I, believe it or not, I used to be a hardcore Republican, and uh, uh, I don't think I believed in the Patriot Act ever. That's when I started to go bad, but I voted for Ronald Reagan a lot. Um, but once I read Atlas Shrugged, it changed my thinking completely. And uh, it's become a lot more popular in recent years. But what we have today, in my view, is, is art imitating life and life imitating art. And uh, we're really truly at this point in time, but it hasn't come suddenly. It's actually come over a long period of time. And that's, that's gonna be the personal story I'll tell you a little bit about. Oop. So our next most important revolution is moving off this earth. It was just like our ancestors that left Europe, that left other parts of the world that came here. Can you imagine what it was like in the 1800s how many have been to Europe? And, and some of you are probably from Europe, right? Little tiny villages. It's comfortable to live there. You, hell, you didn't even have photography. You had no idea where you were going. You get on a boat. Somebody says, oh, it's paved in gold. You'll have a job. You take your family. You go over there. How are you going to do that, right? Those are some brave souls that did that. We still have that spirit in our, in our species. This is, this is who we are. We wander. We, we move out. We do things. And guess what? The government follows us. It doesn't lead us there. So here's my bigger message. So this is something I grew up with. I, I had probably the most wonderful grandfather in the world, and I sat on his lap watching this. And this used to be the sole domain of governments. And now that's really changing, and that's, that's a good thing. What's happening is entrepreneurs now uh, have made enough money that we can actually rival what the governments used to claim as their own domain. The governments become so incompetent in how they execute this basic function of space travel that's left the door wide open for the entrepreneurs. And we've rushed in. We didn't realize we were rushing in in the beginning, but we did. And so I'm going to tell you that the first people that arrive on Mars are going to come by private taxi. They're not going to be here with black government limos. It is not going to be a government guy. It's going to be Elon Musk. It's going to be one of his astronauts. The government's not going to do it. The government may say that they're going along, but they're just there for the ride. They're following in this case. And these people like our ancestors will stay 
and they'll, they'll innovate and they'll live off the land and they'll figure out a way to make a new home on Mars and hopefully later, long beyond when I'm passed from this earth and probably all of you in the, in the auditorium, other planets later on once we master the physics we don't even know about today of, of going into interstellar travel. Oops. Help me out here. I'm not, I'm not moving. Oh, there we go. So, so the, uh, here's something very interesting to think about. Once this happens, the, 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 the most famous human being in the world is not born yet. And yet I can tell you everything about this person. This person is going to be the first one born off the earth. Why is that going to be the most famous human being? Because this will represent the most significant accomplishment of mankind, which is to move off of this rock that we live on, that we were all born on as a species, and that we have learned enough and we have built enough to move off of it. And so that person who's not yet born, may be born in our lifetime if we're lucky. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's in our children's lifetimes. But this will be the most famous person in the entire world ever. And this accomplishment will not be done by governments. It'll be done by people like you and me. It'll be done because we want to do it. We think it's a worthwhile cause. It won't be done to make money. Maybe, probably will make money. In fact, we need money to do this. But it will be done because it's a worthwhile thing. And there's something inside of us that calls us there. And we will, we will do it. So the other thing is cryptocurrency will go there too. So as, as uh, Colin was saying nicely in, in uh, his speech, uh, cryptocurrency has a lot of legs into a lot of other things on how you organize societies. And it's my personal belief that cryptocurrency is a big part of this revolution that's coming because it's independent of government. It's a way to track wealth. It's a way to track agreements. It's a way to have accountability. And I believe that as, as we expand privately into space, cryptocurrency is going to be a fundamental part of how that happens. So let me give you a little bit of um, a personal story here. And uh, I assume all you guys know who Elon Musk is, so uh, I'm going to not go into a lot on him. But um, he, he's one of these guys that's really started a revolution. And we all have our opinions about Elon. And, and just for the record, I like Elon. Um, I couldn't live with him, so I left him. Uh, no, I was never married. But um, so, so, so he and I, our lives kind of collided in very interesting and strange ways. I never, I never thought anything would ever come in my life. I, I grew up in a little place in the mountains in California on a chicken ranch. My dad delivered uniforms. My mother ran a little hospital. Um, we didn't have any money. You know, we could barely. Uh, the food on the table, let alone anything grandiose. So I never, never really thought I would, I would end up doing much of anything. And, and in all honesty, this is the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life. That's the only thing I knew for sure is just to race cars. So uh, it still is, in fact, the only thing I really know what I want to do with my life. So uh, everything else is just to earn enough money to pay for this. So in point of fact, um, I eventually realized as I, as I started growing up that I would have to go get a, probably a formal education Okay, it's a different era, right? But in the 80s, early 80s in particular, if you wanted to make money, you really had to get a formal education. So I went and got an engineering degree. And uh, the, the only good thing that really came out of that engineering degree, I actually got two of them, was I got the ability to, to design a car for Mars, right? So, so Mars was kind of cool. I go back to, you know, watching uh, Apollo with my grandfather. So the idea of building a car on Mars was cool. This set off a set of events that I had no idea where it would end up, which is kind of where we stand today. Um, I ended up going over and getting involved in a French uh, space program. I worked for the French Space Agency for a number of years on a Soviet French program. Now, this is the 1980s. And uh, for an American to go over and work with our hated enemy, the Soviets, and uh, I told you how I feel about them. Uh, but it was very interesting. It's like you're drawn to your enemy. It's, it, you, you want to know more about them. You want to understand them. And I was too young, too stupid to know any better. So I went over and we, we, we were building a balloon for Mars. Truly, we were building a balloon for Mars. And uh, one of the guys that I got involved with is Carl Sagan, you can see there in the middle. And you'll see another person, Lou Friedman over here. And that's Bruce Murray on the left, who used to run the Jet Propulsion Lab. They ran something called the Planetary Society. They were founders. This was one of our first uh, organizations in this country that said to the government, we're tired of the things you're not doing with our money in the space program, and we're going to form a private advocacy group to make you do those things. 
And so they were very idealistic. In fact, Lou, Lou's still alive. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, he was a registered member of the American Communist Party, okay? Lou and I couldn't be different than politically, right? But, but Lou and I had the same kind of view of, of, you know, we just need to do stuff. So members for the Planetary Society put their $20 checks together and they sent me to France to be a part of this mission. So it was the first privately funded involvement in a deep space mission. So I spent a number of years over there and I got, actually ended up learning French and Russian and I got to know the, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet uh, uh, military industrial complex because it was, you know, civil space was still mixed in with military. And uh, everything went fine until one day we were in Riga, Latvia in 1991. We woke up and the, the radios there, just to show you about technology, the old Soviet radios had three buttons on them. So you couldn't listen to BBC or anything like that. And you, you could listen to the three approved Soviet stations, like Radio Moscow, Radio Riga, and, and Radio Baikal. And all three buttons were playing Soviet anthem. And I'm thinking, okay, somebody died or there's been a revolution. Well, it was number two. And uh, so we went in in the morning um, to the institute where we were working in Riga, Latvia. And, and, you know, there's one person that came in and said, you need to go home. Uh, you know, there's been a revolution. There's tanks in the streets. People are being shot in Moscow. The hardliners have taken over because there was a, there was, Glasnost was happening. And uh, Gorbachev was trying to liberalize the Soviet Union. He could see the future that, that, uh, that, that there was not a, uh, a Soviet Union in, in the future. So he was trying to get ahead of that. And the hardliners came back and, and took over the government with tanks. So since we couldn't get flights back to France, we decided, and we couldn't get anything to eat in Riga, we decided to go to, to uh, Moscow and see what was going on. By the time we got there, the shooting was done, but this guy, Boris Yeltsin, was, uh, was standing up and uh, he was a local government guy who just stood up and said, we're not gonna take this. And uh, he, he and a bunch of babushka grandmothers, you know, would, would uh, berate the tank drivers who parked their tanks in front of the, the Soviet Duma and, uh, you know, got them to put down their weapons and turn around. And, and so they turned that revolution back on itself. And uh, Yeltsin ended up becoming part of, uh, part of uh, the, the presidency of Russia. And that's how the Soviet Union dissolved. So I was there, I saw it, never thought I'd ever be there. We never thought it would dissolve, right? And uh, so that gave me a problem though, because now this program I was working on was dead. And uh, the, the, uh, the whole country was broke. They didn't have money to pay any of their guys and including the people who developed nuclear weapons and ICBMs and things like that. So you wonder where North Korea got their stuff? Guess what? That's where it was. So I came back to the U.S. I was considered a bit of a traitor because I'd worked for the, for the Russians. And I ended up going back to the university in Utah where I came from. My professor um, was a retired Air Force colonel. And he took pity on me, gave me a job. And I had a young family at the time. I desperately needed it. Within two months, I had uh, somebody from the Defense Intelligence Agency show up at my door asking if I spoke Russian and I knew about the Russians. And I thought I was in trouble. You know, I thought it was one of those Judge Napolitano knocking on the door, you're going away. And it turned out they had some money that they wanted to put in uh, to the former Soviet Union to keep these guys employed, you know, because they knew, we knew back then that the Iranians and the North Koreans were, were out shopping for nuclear weapons scientists. So I went back for about six years and worked with them. Some of the things we did were launched rockets. We built, you know, uh, experiments that we did with the Russians and uh, we also converted ICBMs. So I became a bit of a Soviet expert and uh, that, was, that was all interesting and it was, you know, work that we didn't really complete because as you can see, the North Koreans got away with a lot of stuff. And uh, that also led again to a second um, career of mine with Lou Friedman. He, he always had this dream of building an interstellar uh, spacecraft called a solar sail. He used the sun's light to, or a laser to perpetually keep propulsing. And if you look at the physics, the only way we'll ever go any significant distances is with something like this. So we raised a bunch of private money. Again, Lou being a communist, being sort of an early market capitalist was ironic to me. And uh, I helped him, and uh, we built this, uh, with the help of the Russians, we built this first Worlds for Solar Sail spacecraft, and we flew it out of a Russian submarine. No kidding. The, the GRU, we went out on that submarine as a Delta III out of Murmansk, and we fired it off on a converted ICBM here. So that, that ICBM, they took the warheads out, warheads out. I actually got to see the warhead package sitting over sort of in this protected area that they took out where they put our spacecraft on. So this was definitely a swords into plowshare moment. 
So all that's kind of interesting, but I get this phone call in August of 2001 from this strange guy with a funny accent. And I was on my way home on a Friday afternoon. I didn't know who the hell this guy was. He said he was an internet billionaire, wanted to do a space program. And uh, his name was Ian Musk is what he told me. And uh, I got home and uh, I, I, I told him, I said, look, I can't, I can't uh, understand you. I've got the top down on my car. You know, I'll call you when I get home. So I called back and it was a, and it was a fax number. It you know, gave me that beep ring and uh, I thought, right, a billionaire with a fax phone. That uh, sounds about right to me. So <laughs> I think I went and had a beer. Yeah, and about 30 minutes later, I get this angry phone call back from him. You know, I, it was a Motorola StarTac. We were cool with those. I says, yeah. He goes, he goes, hey, you didn't call me back. And I, I said, yes, I did. I got your fax number. He goes, oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So he, he starts to tell me this whole idea. He's got, he, he starts, he says the same thing today that he said, this was 19, 18 years ago, right? He, he says, I want to make humanity multiplanetary species. I've made all this money. And I'll be damned if I'm going to waste it going, drinking Mai Tais on the beach or pissing it away in, in some other venture. I want to do something meaningful f with it. And Elon's a very idealistically driven person. He's, he's rep reportedly in the, in, the, in the press referred to roughly. Uh, he's, he's rough on people, but he's very idealistic. And he has these ideas and he sticks to them. So he had this idea of sending mice to Mars to show that you know, humanity could believe the Earth as a, some sort of philanthropic gesture. So I said, I said, uh, well, you know, why are you calling me? And he says, well, I need to buy Russian rockets because I can't afford American rockets. They're too expensive. They're like $100 million a piece. And he had, he had this all calculated out. He says, I need Russian rockets, and you're the guy. And I said, okay. So I put together a group of people, and um, we, there was a bunch of us who were sort of orbiting outside of the normal channels of the world. We we'd started to have, have uh, issues with... Uh, the way things were being done in the government aerospace. And we just kind of wanted to do our thing. We we're, we're addicted to actually doing stuff, to making things happen. And so I called on those people. I call them rogues or space cowboys. So um, what we ended up doing was we created a mission. And this is really, I don't show this to too many people. Uh, this is the Mars Oasis mission we created for Elon. And it would grow a, a plant on the surface of Mars. And our idea was we broadcast the growth of that using the CO2 of the Martian atmosphere to grow this plant. And that would be a symbol of humanity reaching out to another planet and the hope and prayer of someday terraforming some place like Mars where we could make it habitable for, for humanity. So Elon was sold on this. He had a bunch of his other uh, wealthy investor friends and we set off to go buy rockets. And uh, so I ended up going over once more to Russia uh, to go buy used ICBMs. They were on sale. Um, and uh, we, we went to one place. It was called Machine Destroy. I'll never forget it. Um, most of these places were surrounded by tall block walls and, you know, razor wire on the top of the wall. And you get to this. It's always snowing in Moscow. I don't know why. It seems like even in July it snows. And you, you drive up to this this gate, you know, and, and there's a guard, and it's a steel gate that must weigh four tons. You drive through that, and you get to the front door, and it's always a big, imposing steel door. And you have to push a button and wait 10 minutes for somebody in a shop guy to come out, you know, Russian hat. And why they're wearing those hats inside, you don't understand until you walk in. You find out it's as cold inside as it is outside. And uh, so you go through this hallway, and I remember Elon going, is this an insane asylum or is this a rocket factory? And the doors were padded. So people with important jobs, they padded their doors with, with vinyl, right? That's insane asylum to us. So the, the chief designer of this rocket was so incensed. And Elon said, did he just spit on us? I said, yeah, he, it's, a, it's a show of disrespect, you know? So, <laughs> so we got out of there, and we went to the next one. And uh, these guys were a little more westernized. They'd been working with some other western countries. And uh, their reaction was a little, little nicer, but in the end, kind of the same. They, they turned to uh, me and Elon, and they said, uh, they said, little boy. And I thought, oh, this is going to be bad. He said, we do not sell our rockets to non-serious people, and you are not serious people, so take your bullshit internet money and go home, please. <laughs> so we said, okay. And one of the guys I had with me was a guy named Mike Griffin. Anybody know who Mike Griffin was? 
I don't see any hands. He became a NASA administrator later. So Mike was a friend of mine. He was one of these misfits that I got uh, involved in this. And uh, so the three of us left, and, and Mike worked in the intelligence agencies at the time, so that's kind of how I knew him. And uh, so every time you get on a plane leaving Moscow, it's like you, you've just attained freedom, right? It's like sovereign territory. So of course we had a drink. And, and while Mike and I are drinking, Elon's up there on his computer, clack, 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 clack. And Mike, Mike's the son of an army uh, colonel, so he, you, you, can, you can forgive him for speaking this way, but he nudges me and he says, what the fuck do you think that idiot Savant is doing? <laughs> and Elon looks back and I said, I don't know, plan nine to save the earth, I think. And Elon says, no, we're gonna build this rocket ourselves. And uh, so Mike, you know, had to further abuse Elon about the idea of building a rocket yourself because there's a lot of people that tried that and they didn't succeed. Only the government could build rockets, right? So, um, the, but Elon's response was, well, no, we have a spreadsheet. And I said, well, Mike, he's got a spreadsheet. This is different. <laughs> so, so Elon turns around and he goes, he goes, well, fuck you both. He says, look at this. So he, he, sends, he sends his computer back and it was actually a pretty good spreadsheet. So what I came to find out was uh, he'd been working with some of my guys that I'd lined them up with and they'd been building rockets in their garage and uh, they had actually built this spreadsheet for them. Those two guys who built that spreadsheet are founders of Vector, by the way. So I'll reveal that story. So John Garvey, so-called Garve, um, had, had been building rockets in his garage instead of doing something sane like building race cars. And uh, this is the sort of thing he showed Elon, what he was doing with sort of spare money and, and his wife's permission and things like that. And Elon had somewhat of a religious experience, right? In fact, uh, they took Elon out to the desert to do a, a test firing one of these things and it blew the thing all to hell. And <laughs> Elon's response was, oh, I see, we're gonna have to buy lots of test stands. <laughs> So while, while John was distracting uh, Elon with this, this is what Elon was imagining, right? So that's what he proposed to Mike and I on the plane back from Moscow. And uh, so I said, sure, you know, like everything else, why not? And he said, I got, you know, $200 million to spend on this. I knew it was gonna cost 700, but I said, okay, fine. So this is, uh, this is the first, uh, first factory for SpaceX. Uh, I took this picture in, uh, I think it was like uh, April of 2002. You can see Elon's uh, McLaren over on the left. He, he erased that McLaren from the world on the 405 by showing off whether he's not a good driver. Um, but this is where we're gonna build rockets. So, and I worked, I worked with him for about a year. And I remember one day being down there, he'd yelled at me a number of times. And I was looking out of my office at this, and I saw rats running across the floor. And I thought, really? We're going to build rockets here? Really? I'm gone. So I left. And so I went back to the intelligence world because we had a war going on, right? And there was a lot of money flowing. And, and uh, one of the things I've always uh, been a part of is this, this is space warfare. So this is the, the space plane that we could never talk about for so many years that exists and goes up there and does mysterious things. And so I did that for a number of years and uh, Elon went on his way and people didn't think he'd succeed, but he did. And uh, I also ended up building another version because I didn't tell you that that earlier Russian uh, rocket blew up on, when it ignited the second stage and it was a big explosion. So we didn't get that one into, into orbit. But we did build another one that, that we've flown the first of two. Uh, and this is the only human built object that can actually do interstellar flight. So this was like one of the first things, you talk about a revolution going interstellar is. So uh, meanwhile, NASA was just in trouble. I mean, we had another shuttle go down. Mike Griffin became administrator. And you know, it's like Judge Napolitano says, you know, when you get into office, you change. Mike became a, a, a total jerk. And uh, so I lost total interest in, in anything aerospace. I walked away from the whole entire thing. I became a conscientious objector to what the NSA was doing. I gave back all my clearances and I said, I'm done. So what do you do when you can't fix things? I went racing. <laughs> so uh, this is me at Road Atlanta. Yeah, and it was good for the heart, I'll tell you, for a couple of years. I won everything I could afford to win, and I drained my bank account, and I had nothing left, so I had to go back to work. But what was happening was interesting. So in those years that I was out, you know, chasing death at each of the racetracks, um, the microsat revolution was happening. And we knew about this, and John, if you go back to the early days of SpaceX, John was trying to teach Elon 
to start with a really small rocket because that's easy to do and that he believed that this was going to eventually happen. At the time, there was no market for it, so Elon wanted to build bigger rockets. Um, so, so that John went on his own way to build that small rocket that he had a dream of. And this was becoming a reality. And what we were doing was turning satellites from what they used to be, which is house size, car size objects that were hundreds of millions of dollars, into stuff that's the size of a loaf of bread. You can bill for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. You realize you can take a credit card. If you have a thirty thousand dollar limit, you can go buy all the parts to a satellite, have it have it ordered and brought to your house. You probably can't screw it together and make it work, and you certainly can't launch it. But you can have your own satellite for that kind of money. So this was a big disruption, and I I personally saw this as something akin to the uh, to the micro uh, computer, which I lived through. You know, I mean, I started out pushing cards through card readers back in college, right? And uh, my first PC was when I was in graduate school. But what we, you know, this is the plot of mass versus time that's been launched. You see all these small satellites just proliferating. The big stuff that goes to geo is becoming less and less. And so we're seeing a massive disruption here. So I saw an opportunity. And I got involved with a number of these companies who were starting to build these satellites by the hundreds. And what was, what was amazing was what they were doing with these things. I mean, these, these are imaging satellites built by a company called Planet. And uh, the, the, the founder of Planet's a really idealistic guy, and he and I clash a lot. But, but uh, he had this idea that we could put this living, breathing image cloud of the Earth together, and that this kind of transparency of anybody from anywhere in the world can buy the imagery, can afford to buy the imagery, to see whatever everybody else is doing. So governments can't hide from governments. Governments can't hide from people. People can't hide from people, and so on and so forth. Like Twitter, it's a tool for good. It's a tool for bad. Like cryptocurrency, it's a tool for good. It's a tool for bad. And what, what they ended up doing was uh, creating a lot of enormous economic value out of this, out of this sort of thing. You, now what we're finding is people are marrying artificial intelligence to this imagery. And you notice Elon doesn't like artificial intelligence. Uh, but they're marrying that with the imagery to understand economic things uh, and what's changing and you know where people are really stashing oil. We found out, for example, in one of these companies I helped, the Chinese government was stashing oil in uh, these, these undeclared facilities and these guys found it out. You know, if the intelligence agencies knew about it, they didn't say anything. And the guys in the Pentagon that would see this data, they go, oh, well, that's interesting. We didn't know they had that kind of reserve. So either somebody's not doing their job or they're not telling. And these guys fixed it. So we also, uh, I got drugged back, you know, once, you, once you're in, the, in that world, you always are in that world, it seems. I got drugged back only because a, a guy who was one of the SEAL Team 6 members that I, for the warfighter, they're close to my heart, okay, those guys, they preserve our freedom. And this guy asked me to help, and he needed my help because I knew the planet guys. So we actually put a program together because our spy satellites weren't capable of seeing what the hell was going on in North Korea. You know, I can't tell you how much money we spend, but it's a lot, and we still don't get stuff that works. So they had to set up a program where we buy private satellite imagery to find out what the North Koreans are doing. Have you noticed that now we announce it before they launch their rockets or they do a nuke test? It's because we have a neighborhood watch program in North Korea using commercial satellites, using microsats. And that was only possible because of this, this revolution. There we go. So what, what, this was the irony for me, and I've been called a dangerous thinker which I, I wear that badge of honor. I'd like to get that tattooed on somewhere. Um, that I, I call the US government procurement system, the military industrial complex, a Soviet economic system. How are we different than the uh, Soviets? We have a five-year plan. We go ahead and we, we build uh, what the government says. There's no, there's no market economics. And when you start to look at what the commercial space guys are doing, it's a much more compelling world. These guys are stuck in Soviet land post-World War II. So I formed a company called Vector, and I sold my stock in SpaceX, and I went and bought John Garvey's company in building this little rocket. But we had a much bigger idea than just the rocket. What we want to do is we want to transform the world of space. We want to make it relevant to the average person in the same way that cryptocurrency, but you're just gonna be able to program and upload it to our, our app layer. So that's, uh, that's where we wanna see this go. So we first have to solve the launch problem, and then we solve how do we get your ideas, your intellectual assets into space, because it truly is a new economic frontier. It's a frontier of liberty. It's a frontier of our human heart. 
And so we do this in a two-step piece. We build these micro rockets first, and then we're putting together what we call our software-defined satellites known as Galactic Sky. And uh, this is where Nexus starts to come into the, into the thing. So we, we've been building prototypes of this rocket. You know, this is a great country. Second Amendment allows you to bear arms. We found out you can bear ICBMs too. <laughs> uh, this is one of our early prototypes. We, we did a little, little uh, stunt and took it down through the middle of uh, Tucson and you know, we blinked an eye, right? Oh, Martha, that's an ICBM. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> We even, the governor of Arizona became a fan of ours and invited us to bring it up to show him. And so we left in the dark. This was about a year ago. And by the time we hit the south end of Phoenix, uh, the news helicopters were falling. So it being broadcast live, you know, rockets going down the road. So we're, you can see our rocket over in the bottom left. You, this is what we call the rocket to nowhere here. This is a NASA rocket. Uh, the, the one, oh. There it is, right there. And then the Apollo rockets there. You can see we're just teeny little things. That's all you need to do this job. And we'll, we'll build more of them instead of building them large. Whoop. Okay. And then uh, Galactic Sky is our software-defined satellite network. And we have about 40 patents on this, but it essentially allows, it's, it's virtual machines in space. And we're using terrestrial network technology. We brought in uh, the Silicon Valley DNA that did uh, you know, a lot of the early internet work, a lot of the server work. So we're, we're essentially putting a cloud layer in, in space that if you guys want to put cryptocurrency there, you're welcome. If you guys want to use the imagers and have an app that just takes snapshots, you want to try to find your, your lost kids, you're welcome. If you're Johnny Law and you want to find, you know, people are violating the law, well, they're welcome too, I guess. So uh, this, is, this is the vision for this, and we're starting to build this, this constellation out. It's going to be a space-based net mesh network that the entire world will have access to, and the kind of uh, uh, cost to, to access it will be within the affordability of most, most uh, average folks. So we're not talking about something that's the domain just of the large corporations or the large governments. And of course, uh, cryptocurrency is welcome, uh, but uh, we uh, will probably only be accepting Nexus. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Woo. How do you feel like you just went to Mars and back? Isn't that amazing? Look at the future. And the future is very bright with crypto and with freedom. We're combining that here, and you get a chance to experience it. Our next speaker here in this auditorium is one who is known worldwide for bringing freedom and liberty through cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to people. The Bitcoin Jesus, Roger Veer. He'll be here in 10 minutes. Got a little break for you right now till 11.15. Be right back here. And don't forget the other sessions going on in the other facilities.
Same thing. Here's this. Check yep. the power switch. Gotcha. These are not their waters. Trust me, I know. I know. Yeah. I, rec I recall some, some, some gaps myself. Hey, but it was free.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 11.15, according to my watch. Do you have 11.15? Somebody got a cell phone out there, 11.15, 11.14. Okay, we're going to get started with a little bit extra. No extra charge for that either. And uh, we'll have a good time because I tell you, this next speaker coming up is incredible. Why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and start moving in. And someone back there, please close those doors behind us there. Make those, sure those doors are closed. That'll keep it a little bit quieter. As we get going, I am so excited about our next speaker and what he's going to be talking about. Our next speaker hails from a wonderful country that is dear to me. I've been to many times, and I just want to get back to more and more, called the Land of the Rising Sun, Japan. And from that position, he operates a worldwide enterprise that is helping bring freedom. It's helping to bring liberty to the world. I had an opportunity recently to head up a venture. Many of you know of the situation with Ross Ulbricht and what he went through and what he's going through right now. We spearheaded a venture where we were able to reach 14,000 people in an eight-hour Google Hangout. And we raised over $50,000. 100% of that went to the defense fund of Ross Ulbricht. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of work, but well worth it, and uh, you're going to hear more about that and future plans from Lynn Ulbricht tonight. But Roger was a person who was integrally involved in that, helping us in many ways, giving content, giving his ideas. Roger is a person that, yes, he's been known as the Bitcoin Jesus. He's been known as a person that when Bitcoin was first out, he helped people discover it. Matter of fact, my first Bitcoin came from Roger Veer when I had lunch with him in Mexico at Anarchapulco, and he paid for his portion of the tab in Bitcoin, showed me how to get a wallet, how to put it on there, and he's done that with many other people. Today, he's scheduled to speak about a certain topic that's on there, but he said, Terry, I got something even better. As of last night, something amazing has happened, and Roger Veer is going to reveal for the first time anywhere on the planet what is going on? He's going to do it here in jet lag state today. Bless his heart. He's here from Japan, and afterwards, he's going to go get a much-needed nap. But for right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you a man who stands for what is right with the world, the opportunities that we have, both with technology, but grounded in the principles of liberty and freedom. Join me in giving a rousing welcome to Roger Veer. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, you thought you were going to hear about Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> You're going to hear about something that's probably as exciting or maybe even more exciting than Bitcoin Cash at the moment and wasn't possible before the invention of Bitcoin. So you're gonna hear about freesociety.com, the next step after Bitcoin. So uh, I think we're at the right conference to announce this sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. So to sum it up, we are purchasing sovereign land from a government to create the world's first libertarian country. So as I'm sure uh, a lot of people in this room are aware that lots of people have made uh, a lot of money thanks to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And a big giant chunk of those people are hardcore libertarian voluntarists, you know, free market advocates. So what's the next step? Here it is. All right. So who are we? Myself and my good buddy, uh, Olivier. Uh, we came together. and We've been working on this for a while. Olivier was a very, very early Bitcoin adopter, even earlier than myself. Uh, he's been working on this sort of thing for the last 10 years. He's a lifelong libertarian. I'm Roger Veer. I'm the first uh, investor in the entire Bitcoin ecosystem for Bitcoin startups and that sort of thing. I'm also a voluntarist. For people that don't know what a voluntarist is, it's basically somebody who thinks that all human interactions should be on a voluntary basis or not at all. And the difference between a voluntary interaction and a coerced interaction is the difference between working for a living or being a slave. It's the difference between making love or being raped. And so all throughout society and all your interactions with people in your day-to-day -day life, everybody deals with everybody on a voluntary basis, with a few exceptions. Murderers, rapists, thieves, and governments. 
So if we all know that murderers, rapists, and thieves are bad people for dealing with each other on a course of non-voluntary means, what does that make you think about governments? So anyhow, in history, there's been other people that have tried to do things. So there was the Republic of Minavera. I probably didn't pronounce that very well. Uh, but it was basically a sand atoll out in the middle of the Pacific. And a very, very wealthy a group of people, I think it was in the late 70s, went out there and started dredging up more sand. And they tried to build their own island out in the middle of uh, the Pacific. And they wanted to start their own, you know, libertarian-ish, uh, you know, geographic piece of the world there. And what happened, as soon as they had spent a whole bunch of money dredging up this uh, sand atoll and turning it into an island, uh, the neighboring, you know, local coercive... You know, violent thug showed up from the government of uh, Tonga, I believe, and said, oh, thank you for dredging up this land for us. It's ours now. And they used a bunch of guns and kicked them out of there. Sealand is another very, very interesting story. It was a gun turret that was abandoned off the coast of the UK after World War II. And some people have set up a, a data center out there, and they, they kind of say that it's their own thing. Uh, anyhow, seasteading is also very interesting. Uh, and Liberland is another project uh, between Croatia and Serbia where both countries claim this land doesn't belong to us. The reason they're claiming that land doesn't belong to either of those countries is because if they lay claim to that land, they lose claim to an even bigger piece of land that both countries want a lot more. But uh, that's another fantastic project that I'm a big fan of and a supporter of as well. And uh, you know, anything that's peaceful, that's, that's my motto. Anybody should be allowed to do absolutely anything that's peaceful. So um, throughout the world, you know, if you can raise enough money, why not just ask? Hey, there's a lot of governments out there with a bunch of debt and poverty and natural disasters. Just ask them, hey, if we give you a whole giant pile of money, how about you give us some land? And that's exactly what we've done. And uh, we've been really, really surprised by just how much uh, reception there's been from these governments. So uh, we can help them clear their national debt. We can help pretty much everybody that's at this conference realizes that the more economic freedom a place has, the more financial prosperity they have. Uh, you know, if you look at the, that's right. So. If you look around the world, the places with the most economic freedom have the most material wealth. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen in short order with our uh, economic free zone. So, uh, and of course there's you know, tremendous employment opportunities there because of this. And we already have more than a hundred million US dollars of private capital committed to this. And that's just the start, right? To make it clear, the lawyers have told me very, very carefully that this is not an ICO. <laughs> so, we all so we are not, we are not having an ICO. I just want to make that clear. But we're exploring very carefully what the appropriate ways to allow the general public to participate in this as well. So the hundred million dollars is uh, from people the hardcore libertarians that uh, have made some money in the cryptocurrency space that want to see a free society within our lifetime. So we have a bit of uh, selection criteria, right? We want to find a place that's close to existing economic powerhouses, needs to be accessible by water. We, want, we need it to be in a stable government uh, conflict free area. You know, we don't want to build it where there's a war zone going on already. Um, we need to have a big enough piece of land where we can really do this. And we need uh, the existing country that we're going to buy land from has to have a constitution that allows for this sort of thing. So actually, we called up some governments already. We've been talking to a number of governments already. And uh, we were stunned by just how interested and enthusiastic they were. They're like, you're going to give us a bunch of money for land we're not particularly using already at the moment. So uh, it was really, really a pleasant surprise just how interested they've been. And of course, uh, Small governments are easier to deal with than big giant governments, and uh, we'll be naming some names in the future, but not quite yet today. Um, and of course, the timing is right, right? People all across the world are realizing that government doesn't work. Uh, a big influencing book in my own life was Harry Brown's Why Government Doesn't Work, and I, I read that book and it started to open my eyes. I guess government doesn't work. And, uh, the whole world is becoming decentralized right before our eyes. I and mean, we, we're all here at this conference, we know that. Um, but the rest of the world is starting to realize that as well. And governments are, you know, they're not only going in the opposite direction, they've, you know, been in the opposite direction since day one. They're a coercive institution that deal with other individuals by violence or threats of violence. And for any sane person, you should realize that dealing with other adults through violence or threats of violence, that's not the right way to live your life. So uh, governments uh, and all forms of violence uh, 
we're going to do away with those as much as we possibly can. So, uh, and basically, we need to set the right example for the rest of the world, right? There's not going to be any government of any kind. Uh, all the basic rules will be agreed upon up front. So we're going to buy this land, and we're going to set the rules of the game plan there. And uh, if anybody's read uh, David Friedman's The Machinery of Free Freedom, there's a bunch of uh, fantastic uh, examples of how this could potentially work. But at the end of the day, the free market's going to be what figures it out. So uh, the law and the Constitution are going to be part of the actual land deed for this. So think of it kind of like a private home, and home ownership uh, association. You lay out the ground rules from day one, and, and that's the playing rules. And uh, it's going to be, again, based on the ideas of uh, voluntarism and the non-aggression principle. Um, competing private protection agencies will deal with uh, protection, right? Think about it. If a police car pulls up behind you while you're driving, do you feel more or less safe? <laughs> if you're driving down the road and a private security guard that uh, patrols the local shopping mall pulls up behind you, do you feel more or less safe? Probably about the same. Um, but that should tell you which one of those agencies is doing a better job of making you feel safe and secure in your belongings. Um, and uh, we'll negotiate some additional protection from uh, external threats from the country that sells us the land originally. The United Nations, I'm sure everybody here is uh, probably not that big of a fan of the United Nations. We're not going to join! So. so, of course, no plans to join, right? It would require a central authority. This land isn't going to have a central authority. We're all about decentralization. We're going to buy some land. There's not going to be a central authority. And not dealing with the UN avoids a lot of other issues. So I'm sure you're all wondering about passports. That would require a central authority. It would require UN membership, right? Just use your existing passport. Kids can automatically get the you know, citizenship from their parents. The private market's going to come up with way better alternatives than passports, right? We can have uh, ID systems in the blockchain. A lot of people probably don't realize it because everybody here was born after World War I. But before World War I, you didn't need a passport. You just showed up wherever the heck you wanted to go, and that was it. There was nobody there waiting at the border saying, your papers, please. And that's how it's going to be in our free society as well. So limitations, right? We need to minimize our attack surface. No nuclear weapons. Wikipedia has a great example of why nuclear weapons are a violation of the non-aggression principle. Uh, basically because they can't be used for any defense of purpose uh, ever, and it's a threat to everybody around you. You can't export weapons and drugs, mainly because the other governments around you are going to be mad about that, if, and they probably won't sell us the land, so that'll be part of the land title. We'll have some sort of age of consent, uh, and we won't be uh, allowing people to secede. That'll be built into the original land title that they've agreed to when they purchased the land. So. What's next? Uh, we're exploring ways for the public and the interested parties to participate again. This is not an ICO. Uh, we welcome all libertarians, constitutional experts, free thinkers to join us, voluntarists, free market advocates, anybody who wants to participate is uh, welcome so long as you uh, are a fan of the non-aggression principle. So that's our big announcement. Sorry we didn't cover Bitcoin Cash, but before the invention of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, this sort of thing wouldn't have even been possible. So uh, Bitcoin enabled this. This is the next step uh, after Bitcoin. I think I have... Uh, about 10 minutes left for questions. I imagine there's probably a few questions. Uh, speak up, don't be shy, and uh, visit uh, freesociety.com for information. We have a white paper up there. Um, who has a question? I see lots of hands, okay. so And Lynn Ulbricht is right here in front, so Lynn gets to go first. Uh, Ross Ulbricht's mother, for those of you that don't know. So. Yep, so uh, the question for those that couldn't hear, what about uh, people being extradited from this land? So uh, we were actually just talking about that earlier this morning, and uh, we're not sure, to be honest. So I, I suppose if some other country wants to extradite somebody, they'll have to contract with one of the protection agencies in the land or, to get them, or come and get them themselves? Or, I was thinking we'll more see. of extraditing from the United States, somehow getting yeah. someone from the United States. So the, the question is, how would we extradite someone from the U.S.? Uh, well, it's just a little fantasy. Yeah, I, I don't think the I think the U.S. is the big bully, and uh, I think they do whatever they want. And as much as I would love to help on that front, I, I I'm not sure how we can help on that front at the moment. So, and this guy looks very very eager with his hand up in the back. Would the population be armed to the extent to be able to defend 
defend themselves against the existing sovereign government should a problem with the sovereign government arise? Uh, so the question is, will the, the citizens, or the not even citizens, the people living there uh, be armed enough to defend themselves from the previous sovereign government that owned the land? Uh, hopefully. We'll see. Um, there's a whole lot of details that need to be worked out. Uh, but at the same time, even if we don't get everything absolutely perfect from day one, it's still probably going to be a heck of a lot better than any other country in the entire world at this point. Uh, so I, I think this guy in the back was even more good, but you're next. So. And so the question is, can we grow and research cannabis uh, on this land? Uh, probably not for export. Uh, a lot of it will depend on what sort of negotiations we're able to finalize with the country that we purchased the land from. Of course, any sane person that's heard of the non-aggression principle would have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, but you know, the devil is always in the details. And again, a lot of it will depend on exactly what sort of agreement we can get from the existing country with the land that we purchase. And I promised you were next. Yeah. Thank you. So what size land are we talking about and what size society in numbers, just so I can grasp the concept? So the question is what size land, what size society, how many people, you right. know, how big of a place? Um, the bigger the better, right, right uh, is the answer. So a lot of that will depend on uh, once the lawyers figure out exactly how we can allow the public to participate. A hundred million dollars is just the start, right? We would love to have Half a billion dollars, I don't think is out of the question. Maybe even a billion dollars can be raised. And there's a lot of cryptocurrency millionaires out there that uh, should, would and should love this project. So uh, the more money we raise, the bigger uh, a piece of land we can buy. And maybe we'll even do a couple of different pieces of, of land in different parts of the world and have a couple of competing areas as well. So the more places like this we can set up around the world, the better. And uh, the more money we raise, the more, the more we can do. So no limit on geographical well, if, if the United States would sell us 100% of their land mass, then maybe we would do that. <laughs> um, do you have a short list of countries that are willing to... Yeah, we definitely have a short list. We've actually already been talking to a number of countries. Unfortunately, I can't tell you the names of them right now, so I'm going to have to leave you in suspense on that say, front. You meant to say, what are the names, not do you have a short list? <laughs> yeah, uh, those, those names will be coming in the future, but uh, I can't tell you at the moment. I'm sorry. Okay. So... Oh, nice to see you again. I applaud your idea, great idea, and the execution and two of them in final. One concern we might all have is what's to stop the governments that sell your land trying to seize it back when it becomes a sort of powerful state for a very wealthy community? I mean, if you know, there's history, history has shown that when you American government seize gold, anything that's an asset which is not decentralized, land cannot be decentralized by its very nature because it's a fixed and it's an immobile asset. What's to stop any government, even the government that didn't serve to you, saying, we want this, we have that it? So his question is, what are we going to do about it once we build this into you know, the world's most pro prosperous you know, geographical area in the world, and the government that we bought the land or some other government nearby decides, hey, you built a lot of nice stuff. We want to take that. Um, so David Friedman refers to that problem in his book, uh, The Machinery of Freedom, Freedom as the hard problem. Uh, I think the hard problem has been solved. Um, I don't necessarily feel incredibly comfortable talking about that solution in public at the moment, but if you Google that, there's information about that, and that ties back into one of the other questions, though, as well. Um, so. so, what would determine what is the criteria you're saying that is up, um, to be able to be allowed to live there? Like, in other words, you know, how do we get in the curly gates, so to speak? So uh, we're, we're working out all the details again. And once again, this is not an ICO. Um, <laughs> but the idea at some point is to basically auction off the land. Uh, and then anybody that buys land can do whatever they want with it within the, the title restriction of the land. And again, the question was, how, how do you get to come there and be, and be there? So uh, you know, the free market is, I guess, the short answer. So. So the question is, will there be taxes? Uh, of course not. No, this, this society is based on the non-aggression principle. And what about the roads? Um, well, here's a pretty fancy piece of technology in my pocket, right? Governments didn't build this. This is a heck of a, it allows me to, to, to contact anyone anywhere on the planet 
for, you know, I don't know, a couple pennies a day, depending on what my bill is, less than maybe a dollar a day. I can contact anyone on the planet and communicate with them. That's a heck of a lot harder and more complicated to build than a flat spot on the ground. <laughs> but granted, flat spots on the ground are important. <laughs> but uh, I think a nice way of looking at it uh, will be just like, you know, you have a, a big skyscraper building and you have an elevator shaft and all the tenants within the building contribute to to maintain the elevator, it'll be, it'll be the same way. All the property owners nearby, they want roads, they'll chip in voluntarily, and uh, the free market will figure it out on, on the details. So no, there will be no, there'll be no taxation of any kind. There will be no central authority of any kind to impose that taxation. We're gonna find out what a free society actually looks like and works like. And uh, even if you're not a libertarian, even if you're not a voluntarist, even if you're you know, a hardcore statist and you love government controlling everything, you should love and support our project. And the reason why you should love and support our project is because all of us crazy libertarians can go off to our little piece of land and we can fail miserably. And you state loving, you know, president worshiping people out there can say, look at how bad they screwed everything up. Look, we need our government. So even if you think I'm a nutcase and voluntarists and libertarians are nuts, you should still support our project so you have something to point at as, as to how badly we failed. And I don't think we're going to fail. Yeah, uh, the devil's always in the details. The more land we can get a hold of, the better uh, in our book. And a lot of that will depend on exactly how much capital we come up with. But we have, you know, over $100 million of private capital already committed to it. So that's a pretty good start. So, Joby. Is there going to be any kind of vetting process besides I have a billion dollars selling land, like, you know, for people that want to, you know, join? Or are we just going to say, well, communists can come and mass murderers can find uh, exile here and, and save them? <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, are, we, are we going to say, well, no, you've already killed the genocide over here. We're not going to give you safe haven on our island. Yeah. Um, are we, are we going to allow people like that on the island, or are we going to vet them first? So your question is, are we going to let you in, Joby? <laughs> 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 um, the, the devil is always in... <laughs> the devil is always in the details. Um, my initial gut reaction is that we probably wouldn't allow people to buy in if they have a bunch of money that was stolen from others. <coughs> Texas. Um, so, uh, but uh, again, we'll have to work out all these and there's still, you know, this is in the early phases at this point, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go here, so. I, I think you've just found a new business opportunity. <laughs> so, and then the question for those that, that maybe can't hear because uh, we're live streaming this, uh, the question is: Is are they going to issue IDs and how how you know what sort of what sort of services can we provide? And the answer is: You can provide any service that's peaceful. Do whatever you want. If you want to issue IDs in the country and start a business, go ahead and do it. Right? So. Um, you, you, I'm sorry. You already had a question. So other people haven't had a, a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, I know the idea is for everything to be very peaceful, but do you have authority figures to enforce peacefulness? Uh, you can hire whoever you want to help enforce it, and uh, as long as it's peaceful, you're allowed to do whatever you want. So, the, the general guide, and the question was, you know, how, how do you keep the, the peace? And uh, the answer to that is you don't keep the peace through threats of violence. And that's what we have in society today, is you, we have the peace being kept through giant, massive threats of violence. And if you do anything that disturbs the peace, we're going to hurt you, even if that thing that you want to do is something completely peaceful, like research with a plant. So um, anything that's peaceful will be allowed. And another fantastic book that maybe isn't that well known amongst you know, libertarian circles is uh, Anything That's Peaceful by, I think, uh, Leonard Reed, who's the author of I Pencil. I think a lot of people may know the essay, I Pencil. This is an entire book by him that I think he wrote in the 50s, which is a fantastic book. Um, are we doing okay for time? So, okay. Time. okay. says you have until 12. Oh, okay, I, I thought it was earlier than that. So, and I feel bad, rather than me picking people at random in the audience, maybe we can have people line up down here. Is that all right with you? We would need a Karen? microphone so. and uh, perhaps 
Perhaps we can get. We can have people line up right here, and you can come on the microphone. Yeah, come on down. For short questions, no time for a presentation. The short question. And if you have another question, you can line up right here, and that way I don't have to pick at random and make people feel like I'm ignoring them. So how do you enforce the not peace? How do you enforce the not peace? Yeah, so uh, if you see something not peaceful happening, feel free to take action. Right? It's, it's all of us. So. Yeah. Roger, how much time do you think, for, realistically, would be before we could actually move there? I mean, we're, you're not holding we're keeping your feet to the fire, but just what do you think? Um, so the question was, how long until we can actually start moving there and showing up? Uh, are we talking a year? Are we talking yeah. 10 years, so 20 the, years? Uh, <laughs> all of us are getting older day by day. So uh, no, I, I'm best case scenario, maybe within a year. Mm. Worst case scenario, within five, I think, is where we're looking at. And uh, realistically, maybe two-ish mm -hmm. is probably the right, right ballpark. So. How can we help you build this? Ooh, good question. We, we are not having an ICO. <laughs> um, so you cannot participate in our ICO. But we are exploring very carefully ways in which the public can participate. So keep an eye out for that. FreeSociety.com is the website. Follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you want to get involved on the website, we have a contact form. Uh, we're looking for more people to help us, of course. So. I look, for, I look forward to having your help as well. Thank you. So essentially, you're dealing with governments currently to buy this land. Now, a lot of those governments have acquired their land through force. How do you resolve making sure that, in many cases currently, we use the, the term First Nations have owned that land prior, and the governments have acquired it from those First Nations. Now, if you're purchasing land from the government who had acquired it through force, are you having a method to resolve that? Yeah, great question. Um, my own personal opinion there is for the most part, like of course, what the United States government did to the Native Americans, absolutely horrible. I think the word for it is you know, mass murder, um, absolutely horrible. But at the end of the day, the people that had that happen to them, they're all long dead and gone. And none of the people alive today were the ones that did that. So I'm not sure how we can go back and correct those past wrongs. Uh, for people that have an idea on how to correct that, I'm all ears. I'm not um, trying to say correct it. I'm just trying to say resolve. You know, we're buying. You're, you're yeah. buying something. We'll, we'll do our best to buy land that has the cleanest, blood-free title that we can possibly find. But there's not much of that anywhere in the world at this point. So, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you had heard of the Ubuntu Liberation Movement with Michael Tellinger out of South Africa. A little bit louder one more time. So. <laughs> I was just wondering if you had heard about the Ubuntu liberation movement out of South Africa with Michael Tellinger. So I've heard of Ubuntu and that's as far as I, I know. So maybe you could tell me a, a tiny bit more. And... Um, well, it's basically set up to where... Um... Right into the microphone. <laughs> it's basically set up to where everyone contributes to community projects. So um, every week, if you have you know, a town of a thousand people, for three hours a day, you know, you have 3,000 man hours at the end of the week getting done towards community projects in exchange for free energy technology, which is what he's working on. So um, he wrote a, wrote a book called the Ubuntu Liberation Movement, but it moves us collectively towards a cashless society, not needing money because we've built a sustainable economy okay. by everyone I'll contributing. I'll have to read more. I'll have It'd be a really cool that. thing to implement in your Okay. Town, so. I'll read more about that. Thank you so much for that. So. Um, super all for free market and also for inclusion. Are there thoughts about how to create this economy and create the community so that there's a lot of people involved and it's not just rich white folks? Thank yeah. you. So the more people that participate, the better. And if you have some ideas, we would love the help. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, we got one coming up? Uh, all right, so have you heard of seasteading, and how are you going to work with us? <laughs> <laughs> of, of course I've heard of seasteading. Yeah. I've been a giant fan of seasteading for, for decades now. Um, Pat, a lot of people don't know this. One of the big driving forces behind seasteading was Patrick Friedman. You might recognize that last name. Uh, he's the grandson of Milton Friedman, son of uh, David Friedman. Uh, read all of these guys. 
you know, they, they really, really are sharp thinkers. So, uh, of course, I'd love to work with you guys. Uh, maybe you can start seasteading right off the coast of uh, whatever land we wind, wind up with. So Perfect. I'd love, love to communicate with that. Great. So. Awesome. Thanks. So, uh, join us over there, and we will see you back here promptly at 1230.